Welcome to Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman, the only show where a six-time New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned Bible scholar uncovers the many fascinating, little-known facts about the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the rise of Christianity. I'm your host, Megan Lewis. Let's begin. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Misquoting Jesus. We are sticking with Paul for another week, and today we're going to be talking about his shift from uh, someone zealously persecuting Christians to being an active Christian missionary and one of the most influential people in the formation of the religion. What exactly prompted this shift, and why did his change of heart go to such extreme lengths? Before that, though, Bart, I have a question. And I was mentioning before we got started that it can be a dicey one to ask academics because sometimes you get, I don't. But my question is, what do you do to relax and not work? Oh, my God, I do. (laughs) Wonderful. Very important. Uh, Yeah, no, it's very, I just, my, uh, yeah, uh, I, you know, I believe in working really hard and my my talent is being focused and, and keeping focus. But when I'm not working, man, <laughs> I'm not working. So I, I actually believe, you know, so I, I believe in having a good start to a day, like doing something that will make me happy to start the day. And so I, you know, and what I do isn't what like most people would do. <laughs> I just preface it with that. But but um, I uh, so I always get up early. And um, like six, six thirty, something like that. But then I, uh, for, I get a cup of coffee and I read something that is not necessarily related to my work. Like just read something I'm interested in. Um, and so not a novel. That I read novels at night, but in the morning. Right now I'm reading evolutionary psychology, trying to understand bits of evolutionary psychology. So I'll read, you know, for wow. half an hour, or forty minutes. Yeah. And then after that, I, um, I do, uh, I do Pilates for 30 or 40 minutes, usually just mad exercises for 30 stretching and balancing and Pilates for 30. Then I meditate for 20 minutes <laughs> every day. Then, then I walk the dog. <laughs> then, then I read some Greek. <laughs> I've been reading Plato, <laughs> reading Plato's, uh, uh, so the, uh, some of the early dialogues of Plato. And that's before I get to work. And so for me, that's, that's- wonderful start to the day. And so the problem is, you know, by the time it's like 11 in the morning, like I've been up for five hours, I haven't done anything, <laughs> but it's, it's a great way to start. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I just, I just love getting up. I, I love getting up to something I'm looking forward to rather than getting up and thinking, Oh God, I've got to do this. I got to, Oh gee. I, you know, I just like getting up and starting out that way. And then once I, once that's out of the way, then I'm just like, I can just focus on the rest of the day. I've had some little exercise some meditation and I'm ready to focus. And then I can just kind of go at it for hours and hours. But yeah, I like to start like that. How about you? Do you have, do you have, you, you've got all these kids. You probably don't, you, you don't have a, <laughs> you're, you're not probably doing a lot of Pilates and uh, meditation in the morning. Not, no, not a lot. Josh and I, so Josh uh, broke his toe recently, but before that we started to do some yoga together. I've done oh. yoga for years and really enjoy it. Um, and he always weight lifted, but uh, with his multiple sclerosis, that's getting a little tricky now. So he's mm. transitioning to doing yoga with me. So we did that for a while. And once his toe is not broken anymore, we're going to keep going. Um, but when I need to switch off and not use my brain intensively, I play video games a lot. Um, really? I've, yeah, I've been a gamer since I was in my very early teens and it's just carried through. Um, Hold on. Have we talked about this before? I don't think so. <laughs> Do you, do, you, do you ever play Fortnite? No, I don't. I don't much like um, those stars of games. I like oh. um, adventure games. I like um, role-playing games. I play a lot of Final Fantasy. A couple of people have noticed oh. my Final Fantasy mug uh, that makes the odd appearance on the show. And my oh. current favorite is a video game series called Horizon, which is a kind of post-apocalyptic series, but it has some very heavily archaeological-themed uh like threads running through it which as well as having a fantastic storyline and really fun play style i i enjoy the archaeology as well wow interesting so post-apocalyptic that sounds like as serious as a shoot 'em up game <laughs> <laughs> it is and it when you get into the the very detailed point, points of the plot it's it's a little on the depressing side because oh, of machines overthrow humanity and but it's nice because you're you're in the the world and you're kind of rebuilding civilization and piecing together what happened 
to the civilization that came before you, which as an historian really does appeal to me. So uh, is it is it named Chat GPT? <laughs> well, no, we're civilization. It's not. It's not. It's good. But I will I will keep you posted. Okay. Yeah. Please. Yeah. So we should we should get into Paul and like I said in the introduction, we're talking about his conversion to Christianity. But even that sentence contains a couple of controversial terms that we should probably dive into before we get further. What do people usually mean? when they talk about conversion and is it really an appropriate term to use here? Uh, it turns out it's a big debate and there are, uh, there's a lot of scholarship on conversion, not to, I'm not talking about like Paul's conversion or Constantine's conversion or, you know, uh, the, the concept of conversion because it continues to be a major uh, issue in uh, modern religion, especially in the monotheistic religions, because uh, in pagan religions, you didn't really convert to another religion. Um, because if you started following a new religious practice, you didn't have to give up your old one. And in modern modern lingo, conversion usually means you give up one thing to turn to another. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. And so the, the term conversion just means something like to turn around. Um, and um, it doesn't have to be from a religion to a different religion. The reason it's controversial when it comes to Paul is because uh, many scholars would maintain that Paul did not convert like from Judaism to Christianity. In fact, that's the common view among professional scholars is that's that's not what happened, but that in fact what happened was that Paul continued being a Jew, but he understood that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. And so it's a different form of Judaism, but it's not a conversion from one religion to another religion. He didn't think that he left Judaism. Uh, and I, I actually agree that that's right. I think I do think that he, he did, didn't think that he joined a new religion, but I do think that he turned around. <laughs> he turned around from thinking Jesus was the cursed of God to think that he was the Christ of God. He ended up, he changed in his understanding of Jesus. And to that extent, I think it was a conversion. So if conversion can be used in this sense, because Paul is changing his mind about something specific, how about Christianity? You said he, he didn't convert from Judaism to Christianity. Can we even use the term Christianity this early in the religion's history? Well, yeah, it depends which, which uh, scholar you ask. <laughs> uh, most of my colleagues object. I'd say most. I don't know if most. A lot of my colleagues object to using the term Christian for uh, the early years of Christianity. Many of my colleagues in the field don't think that we should use the word Christian for anything happening during the New Testament period. Their logic is that twofold. One is that people who are believing in Jesus, early on at least, still are Jewish. They're still engaged in Jewish practices and Jewish customs, and they're still circumcising their babies and keeping kosher and, and whatnot. Uh, and so it would, it's not really appropriate to give them a different, call them by a different religion that fully develops later. That's the second thing is that in this early period, you know, Christianity isn't what it became. And so it's not like you have a Nicene Creed and that you've got these ritual services and things and that, and that you think of yourselves as different. And so the, their idea is that you shouldn't really call it Christianity until a later period. I disagree with that. Um, I, in kind of, I'm kind of in a minority on this, but the argument that you shouldn't call it Christianity because it's not what it became later seems flawed to me, because at what point does it become Christianity? Is it Christianity in the third century? They didn't have a Nicene Creed yet. Is it Christianity in the fourth century? They didn't have a Pope yet. I mean, it's like, you just kind of go on, you know, and like the Christianity in the ancient world, um, until modern times, Christianity is not what it became. <laughs> and so when do you start calling it Christianity? And so, so I have a kind of a, what seems to me a simpler understanding of things. Uh, Christianity, of course, is a way of referring to Christ. These are followers of Christ. My view is that anybody who thinks that Jesus is uh, the way of salvation is a Christian, follower of Christ. And 
Uh, and that opens up that opens it up so that you could call Paul a Christian as soon as he converts. Uh, but when I say that he's a Christian, I'm not saying, therefore, he's not a Jew. Yes, he was a Jew and he's a Christian. I've got friends today who still consider themselves both Jews and Christians. And so, uh, you know, that's that's a possibility. And and it would be very different in Paul's day, but it's the same concept. So as we spoke about last week, when Christianity was still in its infancy, Paul went from being someone who actively persecuted Christians to a very committed missionary. What reasons does Paul give for this shift in thinking and behavior? So Paul is um, a little bit, um, I was going to say obtuse, not obtuse. He, he just doesn't say much. That's the problem. He just doesn't give us a lot of information to go on. Uh, the major uh, passage is in Galatians chapter 1. Paul says that he had been persecuting the Christians, trying to destroy the church. And then he says, but when God, um, to God who set me apart from my mother's womb, <laughs> decided to reveal his son to me, uh, and then he goes on to explain that he, he came to realize uh, that Christ, in fact, was the, the Jesus was, in fact, the Son of God, the Messiah, and that this is what led him then to decide he needed to be a missionary to take this message of salvation that God had provided to Gentiles, uh, who were all Jews were already hearing the message from the other apostles, and Paul's going to take it to Gentiles. And so he says, when God revealed his son to me, um, in the book of Acts, um, we have an account in chapter 9 of Paul going off to persecute the Christians in Damascus. This is the famous road to Damascus story. Paul doesn't say anything about the road to Damascus, but in, um, in Acts, Paul's on the way with some companions to Damascus, and he has a, and Jesus appears to him, and uh, he realizes that Jesus has been raised from the dead, and, um, and that's, you know, and so he converts. We have act, act, the account in Acts is problematic for a lot of reasons. One is one I said in my earlier episode, the, the whole, pre, what's, this is uh, predicated on Paul having been given authority by the high priest to go uh, persecute followers of Jesus in Damascus, which doesn't make any sense historically because the high priest had no jurisdiction over Damascus. Uh, but also it's problematic because we have two other accounts of the same event in Acts. And the accounts cannot be reconciled with each other, uh, at least in my judgment. And um, most people look at this without kind of saying, well, they've got to be consistent. <laughs> if you look at them, in one of them, Christ appears and Paul is blinded by the light and he uh, you know, falls off as a donkey kind of thing. And he's like, he's blinded. But the, and he hears Jesus talking to him. Uh, but we're told that the companions, in one of the stories, the companions uh, heard the voice but didn't see anything. In another of the accounts, they uh, they see the light but they didn't hear anything. <laughs> Which is that? It's one or the other. In one of them, Paul's told to go to Damascus, and this person, Ananias, will instruct him about what he's to do next. He does. In another account, he's not told to go to Ananias. Jesus instructs him on the spot. And so you have these various things. And and the whole thing doesn't agree with Paul himself. Paul says in Galatians that when he um when when God revealed his son to him, Paul emphatically states, I did not consult with flesh and blood. In other words, I didn't talk to anybody about it. That's directly contradictory to Acts. He goes to Ananias and talks about it. And then he says in Galatians, he says, and I did not go to Jerusalem <laughs> to confer with the apostles. And in the book of Acts, that's the first thing he does. <laughs> he goes directly to Jerusalem to confer with the apostles. So there are, problems, there are problems with this whole thing. Paul says that God revealed something to him. And later in, uh, in other Pauline letters, he says that, that he had a vision of Christ, that Christ appeared to him. He says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 9. He says this. And so it appears that Christ, Paul had a vision of Christ. He, he was convinced that he saw Christ uh, alive. And as I said in our previous uh, episode, based on Paul's own chronology and everything else we know, this has to be three or maybe even four years after Jesus' death. 
And so Paul thought that Jesus uh, uh, appeared to him from heaven, apparently, and uh, so he knew that Jesus had been raised from the dead. That, and that's what converted him, because he actually saw him. Do other people or did other people claim to have similar visions? Um, well, it looks like they did. We don't ha- the, you know, part of the problem with this period of Christianity, uh, by this period, I mean something like, you know, the first seven, the first uh, 40 years of Christianity for four decades, we only have one person's writings. Those are Paul's. Um, after the year 70, we start getting gospels and other letters and other books and things. But for the first 40 years between Jesus' death and about the year 70, Paul's the only author we have. And so we don't have other, we don't have apostles writing, telling us what their experiences of the resurrection were. But we do have uh, Paul tell us that Jesus uh, died and that when he was raised from the dead, he appeared to Cephas and to uh, all the apostles. And he makes a list of, uh, of people that Jesus appeared to. Uh, this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8. And uh, Paul knew uh, Cephas or Peter. Um, he spent time with him. He knew James, the brother of Jesus, who's also one of the ones that Jesus apparently appeared to. And so it's usually assumed that these people uh, also had visions of, of Jesus, or they, had, they thought they saw him alive after his death. And in the Gospels of the New Testament, um, Mary Magdalene uh, is the first or one of the first to see Jesus alive after, not, not Cephas, but Mary Magdalene. And so it's often thought that Mary Magdalene, one of Jesus' uh, followers, not, not one of his closest ones in the Gospels, but one of his followers, also had a, had a vision of him. And so I'd, I'd say that uh, there, there appear to have been people who were saying, yes, uh, I, I saw Jesus after his death. Does it seem like in the ancient world more broadly, visions of the supernatural were relatively common, or would this have been something of note? Um, well, visions, visions were common then, just as they are now. People often today say, look, if you got all these people saying they saw Jesus, Jesus must have come back from the dead, because why are you having all these people saying it? Well, um, usually the people who tell me that, by the way, that you've, you know, there's so many accounts of this, it's got to be authentic. Moreover, they'll say, uh, in some cases, Jesus appears to groups of people, and you can't get group hallucinations. <laughs> you know, hallucination goes on in your head. It doesn't go in the heads of groups, right? Right. And so people say that. But then there are almost always Protestant uh, apologists who tell me this. And I say to them, okay, um, what about appearances of the Blessed Virgin Mary? Those are extremely well documented in the modern period. We're not taking one person's eyewitness, one person's account from, you know, Decades later, Paul, Paul's account, Paul's writings are decades after these events, and we're taking his judgment on. We're not doing that. You can go interview these people, and there are sometimes hundreds at a time and say, Mary appeared. And so do you think that's a group hallucination? Well, she wasn't there, Well, but they said she was there. Well, so why is it any different? It's the same thing. Somebody says they saw it. And so um, it was common then. It's, and it's common now, not just with like you know religious figures like Mary, uh, and Jesus also still shows up uh, today sometimes. But also, I mean, deceased loved ones, somebody you really love. Um, people have visions of, the, of deceased loved ones all the time. Modern psychological analyses have shown that uh, uh, assessments have shown that one out of eight people has a vision of a deceased loved one. They actually see and they can touch them. They can talk with them. They, I mean, uh it happens all the time. One out of eight of us. So it doesn't that's mean you're crazy. Or anything. Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a big number. But, you know, your grandmother dies and, you know, three weeks later, you see her sitting on your bed in your bedroom and you talk to her. And you're convinced that, you know, you may not think that she's bodily alive, but you think that she's alive and up in heaven and she's visiting you. So what would people in the ancient world have thought if they had one of these visions? Yeah, you know, it completely depends on what their understanding of life after death was. They, they would, they would, they like now would think that the person is still alive, even though they died. Uh, and today, as I just said, you think, well, my grandmother's in heaven and so she's just come down to, 
tell me, you know, and to comfort me. But that's because we think that when you die, your soul goes someplace. Your soul goes to heaven or hell. And, you know, some people thought that in the ancient world. And so when they, they thought they had a vision, that's what they thought, you know, they had that kind of vision of the soul appearing to them. But there were other people in the ancient world who thought that the afterlife was a bodily afterlife. Um, for example, um, Romulus, the, king, the, the first king of, of Rome, who founded Rome, was, uh, was in tradition reported by Livy and Plutarch and others that, that at the end of his life, he ascended bodily up to heaven. And there's accounts of him actually coming back down to talk to eyewitnesses, uh, to an eyewitness to uh, who then later said, I talked with him afterwards and he, you know, he's alive. But he came down bodily because that was his understanding. He ascended bodily to heaven, which is different. Jewish apocalypticists like Paul and the apostles and the follow, other followers of Jesus, like Jesus himself, John the Baptist, their view was that, uh, this, that a person dies and they're dead. Um, but at the end of time, uh, God is going to raise the dead back to life physically. It'll be a physical resurrection. And that's what the afterlife is, is at the end of time, there'll be a physical resurrection. Uh, and so if somebody's alive again, it's because God's brought their body back to life. And that's what Paul and the other disciples thought about Jesus, that his body had been brought back to life and had been taken up to heaven then, kind of like Romulus, only it's that the body had been reanimated now, and that that shows that the resurrection is about to happen because the first one's been raised. And so they thought that a body, Jesus' body, came out of the tomb, got reanimated, taken up to heaven, and this was the beginning of the resurrection. What do you think actually happened to prompt Paul's conversion? Do you think he did genuinely have a vision, or do you think it can be explained some in another way? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think we can know, given our source material. I mean, he has these brief references, and Acts has accounts that contradict his, and so that, and that's basically what we've got. Um, I think there are a lot of options. Of course, uh, committed Christians who uh, hold to traditional views of Christianity would say that Paul saw Jesus because Jesus was raised from the dead and Paul saw him. And so that's, you know, that's one explanation. Um, there are lots of other explanations. People see things that aren't there. People have visions all the time of things that aren't there. Um, and I, I talk about this at some length in my book, How Jesus uh, Became God because I have to deal with how, why it is that Christianity started. And I think it started, uh, it didn't start with the death of Jesus. If Jesus had died and, you know, then he stayed dead, <laughs> it wouldn't have Christianity. And uh, so it starts with people believing he got raised from the dead. And so what made them believe? And I argue that's because they had these visions, but I don't think we can explain, we don't know exactly what they were. I mean, either he did come back. If he didn't come back, then, uh, psychologists would call that a non-veridical vision. A non-veridical vision is a vision where you see something that ain't there. <laughs> As opposed to like my seeing you right now, I, I assume you really are there. Uh, but Pretty sure you, I am. I think you are. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but a non-veridical vision is when, you, you know, I see my grandmother and she's not really there. But th there are other explanations. It could be that kind of thing, which can be psychologically induced. Uh, for a beloved loved one or a, uh, a a very important religious figure, both of those types show up a lot. And Jesus, of course, was both. He was a beloved deceased one, and he was a great religious figure. But sometimes, you know, you see somebody and you you get mistaken. You think you mit, you misunderstand you miss take them for someone else. Happens to me all the time. I have sometimes given lectures to an audience where. I was sure the guy in the eighth row was my father. He looked just like my father. Wow. And, you know, I'm a rationalist, and so I'm thinking, yeah, okay, it's not. But, boy, that sure looks like it. But, you know, if I weren't a rationalist, I, you know, I might well think, well, wow, wow that's nice. Um, so he, he could have mistaken something he saw. He could have, uh, it could have been a psychological event in his head. Uh, but not in reality. Uh, there, there are lots of, you know, some people say, well, maybe he made it up. Well, maybe he made it up. I, I don't think so, but, you know, it's possible. I mean, so, so short answer, Megan, is we don't know. <laughs> 
That's sometimes the best answer. We talked a lot last week about Paul's dislike and hatred of Christians before his conversion and the fact that that was seemingly mainly theologically motivated because there is no way for Paul that Jesus could have been the Messiah. So does his sudden shift in belief affect his personal theology? Uh, yeah, it does fairly radically. And I'll say, you know, that uh, it affected him so much that people say, so he must have seen something. <laughs> they had to have, but to say he must have seen something isn't the same thing as saying it must have happened as described. In other words, he, I think he did think, I think he did think he saw something and that, you know, he, I think he probably saw something. Um, and it changed everything for him. It didn't, let me go back on that. It did not change everything. In fact, some things remained the same, and he um, he saw that that you know Jesus raised from the dead confirmed some things that he already thought, uh, and so that's an important first point. Paul, uh, as we talked about last time, was was a zealous uh, Jew who was uh, just absolutely committed to uh, obeying and following the God of Israel, and he was an apocalyptic Jew. Um, he didn't know Jesus or John the Baptist or Jesus' followers at the time, but but he, like so many other Jews, were was raised in an apocalyptic tradition that believed that the world is controlled by powers of evil, that that's why there's so much pain and misery in the world. Uh, God, for some reason, has relinquished control of the world to these evil forces, but God will soon intervene. He will destroy the forces of evil, and he will judge the earth, including humans. Those who have sided with God will be rewarded. Those opposed to God will be punished. And that applies not just to those who happen to be alive at the time. It applies to everybody, because God will raise everybody from the dead. Um, and people will be uh, shown the errors of their ways if they don't side with God, and they'll be ruthlessly destroyed for all time. So they'll have an eternal punishment of eternal non-existence, annihilation, or they'll be rewarded by being brought into a utopian kingdom. Apocalypticists believe this was going to happen very soon. Uh, the world had gotten just as bad as it can get, and God will soon intervene. Paul had that view before he became a follower of Jesus. He was convinced that Jesus could not be the Messiah. He was crucified, but then he saw him alive. And the only way for a person to come back to life is if God raises him from the dead. And if you're an apocalyptic Jew, <laughs> if you get raised back from the dead, you're on God's side. Jesus is clearly favorite of God, and no one else has been raised yet. Christ is the one, the first one, to be raised from the dead. And so this confirmed Paul's view that he was living at the end of time, that the God of Israel was uh, about to intervene, in fact, for Paul, it's already started. The resurrection has begun. And that's why he calls Jesus the first fruits of the resurrection. Uh, it's an agricultural image. The farmer goes out, first day of the harvest, brings in the first fruits, and he gets the rest the next day. <laughs> he doesn't wait, you know, 20 years. He goes the next day. And Paul thought, man, it started. It's going to happen now. And so, so the resurrection of Jesus, once he, he became convinced because he saw he saw Jesus, he believed, convinced him Jesus was raised, that convinced him the resurrection had started, and that confirms what he already thought. Does this <clears throat> excuse me, does this conviction that the end of days, the resurrection was imminent, explain why Paul's conversion seems to have been on such an extreme end of the scale. He doesn't just start attending a different house of worship. He goes on a massive mission of conversion. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, there, there are a couple of things to be said about that. One thing is Paul obviously was really, um, he felt really urgent in his mission to convert people. And I, and I think the urgency absolutely is explained by his sense that it's going to come soon and you don't want to be caught unawares. And so this is a major emphasis of his preaching. But I think the thing that sent him on the mission in the first place wasn't the imminence of the end so much as his realization of what the resurrection meant, both for understanding who Jesus really is 
and for understanding God's entire plan of salvation. <laughs> and so, so it, the way I try to explain it to my students is that you have to imagine Paul thinking backwards from what he experienced to what the conclusions have to be. What are the implications of this? And so the, the way it works is Paul, Paul thinks Jesus is the enemy of God, cursed of God, but then he sees him alive years after the death. And so he thinks God has raised him from the dead. Boom. First thing is, he is not the enemy of God. He's God's chosen one. He's the first God has raised from the dead. Whoa. So then once he thinks that, he's got to think, well, wait a second. He got crucified. <laughs> God, God's favored one? What? God had his favored one crucified? Is that what he does to his favored one? <laughs> What's he do to his enemies? <laughs> I, mean, how, I mean, why would God have his son crucified? Then Paul thought back. Well, he was a curse. He was cursed by God. But if he's the chosen one, he wasn't cursed for anything he did. He must have been cursed for some other reason. And Paul, as a person living in the ancient world, knew full well that the reason people uh, sacrifice animals, and in some cultures, sacrifice humans, is in order to avert the anger of God, or to become pleasing to God, to offer up something to God. Why would God have his son killed? It must have been a sacrifice. God sacrificed his own son. And his son sacrificed his life, but not for his own sins, because he's the son of God. He was righteous. He must have died for the sins of others. And so that, that's consistent with Jewish theology and pagan theology, that a sacrifice is for sin. Can, some sacrifices are for sins. And so Paul kept thinking then, well, if Jesus was sacrificed for the sins of others, that's how people's sins are removed. Sins are removed by the sacrifice of Jesus. But if sins are removed by the sacrifice of Jesus, what what about, I thought within Judaism, that people were right with God by following the law of God. And Paul came to think, actually being right with God doesn't come by following the law. If they came by following the law, there'd be no reason for God to sacrifice his son. You could just keep the law. Well, then God had to sacrifice his son because the law won't do it. And if the law won't do it, that means being Jewish won't do it. And so he keeps thinking backwards. And the implication, I think he comes out almost right away. He says he says it happened instantaneously, but it, it came soon, I think, is that means you don't have to be Jewish. If you want to be right with God, you have it's not keeping the Jewish law. It's not about being Jewish. It's about believing in the death of Jesus. And boom, once he hit that, he realized, oh, my God, I've got to take this message out, not to Jews who are hear it from the others, I've got to tell the Gentiles, they can have salvation by believing in Jesus, and they don't have to become Jewish. And that becomes his mission. Is this message to the Gentiles something that we see elsewhere from other Jewish thinkers, or is this purely Paul's own personal mission? So um, there are two ways to answer this. One is within the Christian movement at the time, so three or four years after Jesus' death, uh, there were uh, the followers of Jesus, the disciples, the remaining disciples, um, assuming they all came to believe in the resurrection um, historically. We don't have we don't have any of them saying that because we don't have any writings from them. The New Testament says they all came to believe. And that may be true or maybe not true. But whoever did come to believe in him started declaring also that his death was the death of the Messiah. They're preaching to the Jews. The idea that the message would apply to Gentiles would have been open to them. Peter or John or the James, the others, they would have been open to the idea that this death is also for Gentiles. But they almost certainly would have said, but, you know, of course, you've got to, you've got to be Jewish to be a believer in Jesus. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. He sent from the Jewish God. He fulfilled the Jewish scriptures. Uh, and so he's it's a Jewish thing. <laughs> you got to, and so they would have said, yes, you need to believe in Jesus for salvation. And to do that first, you need to become a Jew. Paul said, uh, no, um, you don't, you don't, uh, you don't have to become a Jew. You can remain Gentile because it doesn't matter if you're Jewish. What matters is only faith in Jesus. What was the general thought around 
Gentiles converting to Judaism then? Yeah, well, it was, you know, it was certainly permitted, and we have accounts of uh, Gentiles uh, converting. Most, most Jews had no interest in converting Gentiles. Judaism was a religion for Jews. <laughs> and so, um, you know, they didn't, they didn't insist that you, you know, that you follow their religion, or there were not big efforts of Jews to convert Gentiles, uh, we now know. Um, but that having been said, in the Old Testament, there are passages that, uh, in which prophets predict that God is going to use the Jews to bring Gentiles into the fold, uh, that God is using Judaism to reach the entire world, and that even though he called Abraham out of all the peoples of earth to be, uh, to be his special one, his chosen one, whose descendants would be his chosen people, uh, the idea is that eventually even Gentiles would come to acknowledge that God is the one true God. And you get this in places like, especially, for example, in the book of Isaiah. The second part of Isaiah and the third part of Isaiah talk about how uh, there's going to be, uh, that all Gentiles are going to flood to Mount Zion and recognize God, and that God is going to send out a, a person who will be a light to the Gentiles, who will preach salvation to the Gentiles so that all Gentiles will also come in. And so Paul's inherited this tradition that, um, that at the end of time, Gentiles, too, will convert. Now, in Isaiah, that means they're going to become Jews. Paul's understanding that simply to mean that Gentiles are going to recognize that the God of Israel is the true God, and Paul thinks they're going to recognize that by believing in Jesus. The interesting thing that most people have not noticed is that Isaiah talks about this prophetic figure who will be a light to the Gentiles to lead them in. Paul thinks God has commissioned him to bring in the Gentiles. I think Paul believes that he's a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. Paul himself is the culmination of God's plan of salvation. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. That, 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 that's a big thought, <laughs> for, uh, that you're the one that the scriptures are pointing to. But it appears, it appears that's what Paul thought. Fascinating. So it's, it's not, there's nothing completely new and out of the blue in Paul's shift, in the change in, in his thinking. It, it is all still rooted in his um, background and understanding of, of Judaism. Yeah. Would this that's, why, that's, why, by the, that's why, by the way, they, that's why he doesn't think that he stopped being Jewish. He's still, he's the fulfillment because of Because he didn't, yeah. He didn't, he's still a Jew. And so when people today say, you know, things like, well, Paul stopped being a Jew. No, he did not stop being a Jew. He 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 understood that, that Christ was the fulfillment of Judaism, not that he put an end to Judaism. So if we if we view this this shift as a maybe a sidestep rather than a, a complete about face, theologically speaking, what would the social significance have been for this change for Paul? Well, it was huge. I mean, look, it changed it changed everything. I mean, I, it didn't change everything, as I said, because he he thought that in fact this was like God's plan all along, and that, so he remained Jewish and an apocalyptic Jew who thought the end was coming soon was convinced it's coming soon because the resurrection has started uh, and will soon be completed, which is the reason for his urgency. But the other things changed. You know, Jesus Jesus obviously went from being the cursed of God to being the Christ of God. Um, Jesus' death is now what brings salvation. Since Jesus' death is what brings salvation, therefore the Jewish law um, is not what brings salvation. Paul never said Jews should stop being Jewish. He never told Jews, okay, stop circumcising. You don't need to do that. He did insist, though, that Gentiles not become Jewish. This becomes a big issue for him, uh, especially uh, some in the letter to the Romans and especially in the letter to the Galatians. In the letter to the Galatians, Paul is writing a, a set of communities, a group of communities, that have had uh, Jewish Christians come in who are saying they're followers of Jesus, who keep the law still, these mis other missionaries, and they're telling the people that they have to be Jewish. 
you can you can't you can't acquire the promises of God without being a member of the people of God. That requires circumcision. God gave circumcision to Abraham, these people said, and he called it an eternal covenant. It's not a temporary one. It's an eternal one. You've got to be circumcised if you're going to be among the people of God. And so they, they were telling Gentiles that Paul had converted. Well, that's great. You know, you believe in Jesus, but you've got to be Jewish. And Paul fundamentally disagreed. And it's not just that, like, oh, boy, that's not a pleasant operation. <laughs> you do not want the foreskin cut off your penis. I, no, don't do that. You don't need to. It wasn't that kind of thing. It wasn't like, yeah, you don't need to. It was, oh, my God, if you think that, you completely misunderstand. In fact, if you do that, you will, you will lose your salvation because you will be denying that the death of Jesus is what puts you right with God. You'll be saying you have to keep the Jewish law. And the whole point is you don't. So, yeah, socially, it had a huge impact because it means that Gentiles don't have to become Jewish. And if that, if that hadn't happened, if Paul hadn't come up with that idea, Christianity never would have taken over the Roman Empire. I mean, there is no way that, that, that you know, the, uh, that 30 million men are going to get circumcised. It just ain't going to happen. And so um, it, it's, a, it's, one of the, it's one of the reasons Christ, Christianity took over. And I, I talk about this at some length in my book, Triumph of Christianity, how the conversion of Paul to this belief about Gentiles is, was the sine, one of the sine qua non for the success of Christianity. I have one final question before we move on to the next segment of the podcast. A cynical person might suggest that this shift is, is a power grab by Paul. The mm. resurrection is starting. He wants to be, understandably, I think, on the right side of that particular fight. And as an added bonus, he can be the one who's been foretold to bring Gentiles into God. Do you think that's a, a reasonable way of looking at it? Um, I think you know cynics usually cynical views usually you know kind of doubt most things, and I'm 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 as a historian I'm all for doubting most things. I mean I think that's what historians do. You've got to question the sources, uh, and so people question the conversion of Constantine, as we've talked before. You know and say, well, it's just a political ploy, or or Paul, maybe he's just grabbing for power, and it's a matter of probability judgments because we can't get into their heads to know what they're really doing. We can't we don't know their motives. Uh, and we can't decide their motives because we're not inside their heads. Part of the problem is that many people don't know their own motives. You know, they don't know what's really incentivizing them, uh, and you know, or they don't think about it enough. I don't think that Paul was being dishonest personally. In fact, I think it's re really, really unlikely. For one thing, this is not much of a power grab. He, in fact, loses power by doing this. I mean, yeah, he gets a lot of converts and things, but he, I mean, he is getting, um, he's getting flogged by Jewish leaders. He's getting beaten with rods repeatedly by Roman authorities. He's going hungry. He's going homeless. He's starving. He's getting shipwrecked. He gets stoned one time uh, you know, with rocks. <laughs> and so, I mean, it's like it's, he has a horrible life on the outside. It doesn't look like a power grab to me. And I don't think anybody would have imagined that being a missionary for a crucified man is going to be a power grab. And so I just, I don't see it. I mean, I understand the cynicism and I, you know, you know, I'm not, it's not like I'm not religiously opposed to it or anything or philosophically opposed to it. I just, I, it seems so unlikely to me that this is how somebody grabs their power uh, that uh, I don't think so. I think it's a genuine conversion. I think Paul genuinely thought he saw Jesus and I think he genuinely believed what he preached. I don't agree with him. I don't, I don't believe what he believed, but I think he genuinely believed it. Thank you so much for that, Bart. We are going to take a quick ad break and then we'll be back with Bart's weekly update. Imagine this, Jesus, the founder of Christianity and the Apostle Paul, its greatest missionary, teaching and shaping the Christian faith with opposing perspectives. While Jesus emphasized repentance in preparation for the coming kingdom, Paul focused on believing in Jesus' death and resurrection. So were they on the same page? Delve into the complexities of this debate in Bart Ehrman's online course, Paul and Jesus, The Great Divide. 
In this eight-lecture course, you'll discover why Paul rarely mentioned Jesus' words and deeds and uncover the intricacies of their views on salvation, the Jewish law, and ethical behavior. Bart will also explore the following burning question. Was Paul a true follower of Jesus' teachings? Or is it right to say that Paul transformed the Jewish religion of Jesus to the Christian religion about Jesus? Don't miss this opportunity to explore the profound influence of Paul and Jesus on the Christian faith. Visit barterman.com forward slash Paul to learn more or enroll today. And remember, use the discount code MJPODCAST for a special discount. This is Bart's Weekly Update, where we get to catch up on all the latest about Dr. Ehrman's book releases, speaking engagements, ehrmanblog.org happenings, and online course launches. So, Bart, we talk quite regularly, and we just finished talking um, over the past few weeks about the courses that you do on your website, which is bartehrman.com. And we usually say it, it costs X amount of money. You can use this code for a discount. You do have a couple of free courses, though, that we always neglect to mention for people who are interested, maybe don't have spare cash right now or would like to see exactly what they're getting into before they make a purchase. So what can you tell us just what courses are available for free? Yeah, you know, I you know, part of the deal is that I I've always believed in I mean, the, the reason I do what I do is because I believe in spreading n knowledge and scholarship about these topics, the New Testament, Jesus, rise of Christianity, literature, early Christianity. I believe in spreading these topics to a broader audience. And so it's, it's, you know, what I do with my life. And part of that is doing things, not just for, you know, not, not charging for everything, but uh, a lot of what I do is, is, is free. And I've done some free courses that, that uh, for me have been great fun. And, People can just, you know, watch them. And so I think the first one I did for this, uh, for the, you know, for the, for my website, for bartherman.com was, uh, did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John really write Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Good question. Uh, people can see my views about that. And I try to explain why I, I don't think so. Later, the next year, so I've only been doing these courses for two years. So my idea is I'll do a freebie every year. And so the, I think last year it was I did I did a freebie, which was um, why I'm not a Christian. And that's I think that's been the most viewed course that I've done. And it's completely free. You can just go to my website and see see it. And I just explain. I don't try and trash Christianity. I just explain why I myself no longer believe. And I'll do I'm going to be doing another one probably in a few months. We haven't decided the topic, but I try to pick them to be like really pretty interesting things that people would want to know about and just they can get them get them for free. I'd also like to say, you know, I do my uh, the other one of the other free things that I do is um, uh, my blog. Uh, I've I've got this blog that I've talked about before where I post five or six times every week uh, on issues related to all of these topics. Um, I've been doing it for almost uh, almost 12 years now, every week, in and out. People do have to pay a small fee for that, but I don't, I don't get any of this money. It all goes to charity. Um, and if people can't afford the blog, I give them a free membership. And so if people want a free membership, uh, I, you know, if you can't afford it, uh, you know, I just trust that people aren't going to lie about it because, you know, we're talking about, you know, the New Testament here and, uh, you know, you don't want to lie. <laughs> you know what happens to liars in the New Testament. So, so, you know, but if you're, if you're strapped for cash right now, yes, absolutely. I'll give you a free membership. And also every week, one of my blog posts is free. And so, um, so I suggest, you know, look up the Barterman blog and go to the Barterman.com where I have a couple of free courses and I'm going to be adding, you know, at least one, uh, every year. And if the if you do take a look at the the free posts on the blog and you're interested in that, like Bart said, all of the money does go to charity, and it's only I'm looking at the website now. It's only twenty nine ninety five for, for an entire year, and you get access to all new posts that he makes, but also access to all of the archives. And Thousands. since two thousand twelve, <laughs> that's five <laughs> posts a week for several years over a decade now yeah two decades and no one decade i'm bad at math yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so and the thing is that the you know the um the, 
for twenty nine ninety five, you can read it, you know, every post. And then there are different tiers of membership. So like if you want to be able to make comments, I answer every question I get. I've done this for over 12. Every question I get, I answer. You, it's a higher membership level. And then there's a higher one if you want some free webinars. It's like it goes up like that. But um, but twenty nine ninety five is is it for a year. I mean, you know, what is that? Less than a dime a day for a, less than a dime a podcast, a uh, post. And so, yeah. And it all goes to charities dealing with hunger and homelessness. Excellent causes, both. Okay, we are going to uh, switch over to another episode of Outsmart Bart. Dr. Ehrman has written six New York Times best-selling books and holds a PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary. It's not often you'll see him made a fool, but it doesn't hurt to try. It's time for Outsmart Bart. Okay, Bart, are you ready? We have three questions. Okay, let's see. <laughs> First up, who was in the manger with baby Jesus? So the manger, so the manger scene is found in only uh, one of our gospels, Luke. Uh, and what Luke says is that um, all it says is that Mar the Mary gave birth and they laid the child in the manger because there was no room in the inn. So they are putting Jesus in the manger. Uh, the manger is a feeding trough for the animals. We're not told that there was a donkey and, uh, you know, <laughs> the typical animals you see in the, uh, you know, in the pageant every year. We're not told they were there, but there's obviously animals there because it's, we're not told that it was a, a um, uh, what do people usually say? That it, not that it was a shack, but that it was a, um, whatever, a, 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 a barn or a hut or something. A stool, it, stable. It, a stall, yeah, stable, stable. That's a stable, and we're not told it was a stable in early Christian tradition. It was a cave uh, where they were keeping the animals. But my students tend to think that Jesus was born in the manger, and no, it doesn't, no, he wasn't born in a manger. He's born, and they put him in the manger. So no, uh, yeah, it, it does not say that Joseph and Mary were with him in the. Manger. It would have been a bit crowded. And, you know, some people today do believe in attached parenting where you all sleep in the same bed, uh, but uh, no indication of the Bible. In an animal trough seems a little <laughs> yeah. bit uh, a little uncomfortable. Extreme. Yeah. Right. Okay. Second question. Who stirred up a riot against Paul in Ephesus? Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. So Paul is in the city of, uh, is in the city of Ephesus and he's, uh, preaching uh, and converting people. And the silversmiths get all upset because the uh, silversmiths are uh, uh, make idols and people worship the idols. And now that everybody's becoming a Christian, nobody's worshiping the idols. And so the silversmiths, uh, it's kind of like, uh, you know, in uh, in your beloved England now, they, they don't just go on strike. <laughs> they, like, the you know, the junior doctors of the NHS or something, they, they like, they, they, they start a riot. And uh, and so they start a riot and uh, and get Paul dragged into the uh, arena to face charges. So the the answer given is Demetrius. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. Demetrius the is the, is the silversmith who who leads the riot. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I should. You're right. Better not give me credit I for should, that I one. Be, I didn't. I should yeah. be more specific about exactly what we're looking for. With no, 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 no. Right. Uh, final question: Who said to Job, "For wrath kills a foolish man, and envy slays a simple one"? Now you said these are New Testament questions today. <laughs> Sorry, I missed that one. <laughs> I don't. Well, no, it's good because I don't mind. Uh, I don't mind getting wrong. Uh, something inside of Job. Okay, so uh, give me the quote again. Wrath kills a foolish man, and envy slays a simple one. So Job has uh, three. Uh, he has three friends. Friends who come to come to him. Um, who uh, say things like this. Uh, and then a fourth friend shows up later. I'll say that it's Bildad. It's not. It's Eliphaz. Eliphaz. Ah, Eliphaz is the fourth. And so, uh, yeah. Okay. All right. It's very hard because it, it's an interesting, I'll tell you, we, we're, we, we're, we should do an episode on Job because it's it's really widely should. it's widely misunderstood. But the the beginning and the end are this kind of narrative story that people know about Job being, you know, P 
penalized by the Satan figure because of God. But then, but the friends are actually friends there. When you get in the middle part, the long poetic section, which is chapters three to forty, um, the the friends are attacking Job because he doesn't think he's done anything wrong. <laughs> and they think he's got to be punished by God because he's done something wrong. So they're all four of them are three of them do this for most of the book. And then uh, Eliphaz comes in at the end and, and does it. So, yeah, this part's Eliphaz. Well, you did better than I would have done, which isn't really saying much, if we're very honest. <laughs> okay. Yeah, now then, good. before we finish for the week, would you mind just summarizing what we talked about today? Yeah, we're talking about Paul's conversion. Uh, we talked about whether conversion is the right word for what happened to Paul when he became a follower of Jesus, uh, whether it's a right word at all in early Christianity, and whether Christianity is the right word for did Paul become a Christian before really Christianity had formed too much yet. Uh, but we tried to understand what happened, what the dynamics were, and I, I, I maintain that Paul did have some kind of visionary experience, I think, and that that completely revolutionized his understanding of Jesus, that he wasn't the one who was the cursed of God uh, per se. He was the blessed one of God who bore the curse for others because God raised him from the dead. When Paul saw Jesus, ra Paul believed he saw J Jesus raised from the dead. He concluded God had raised him from the dead. He concluded, therefore, the death was meaningful for God, that God had planned the death. That made him realize that Jesus must have been the sacrifice for sins and that it's his death, not the Jewish law, that makes a person right with God. And that begins then Paul's decision to go take his message to the Gentiles. Thank you, Bart. Audience, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe to the podcast and make sure you don't miss future episodes. Remember that you can use the code MJPODCAST for a discount on all of Bart's courses over at www.bartermann.com. And that is also where you can find the two free courses, courses that we mentioned earlier in the episode. Miss Quoting Jesus will be back next week. Bart, what are we talking about next time? Yeah, next time uh, we're talking about the topic, who was Luke? <laughs> and uh, so, uh, you know, that has interesting there's actually interesting things. The, the person named Luke is uh, said to have written the, the Gospel of Luke and the, apostle, the Acts of the Apostles. Um, and so part of the question is, uh, who was this figure? What do we know about him? How do we know about it? And is it plausible that he wrote these books? But it gets into some very interesting details of things that most people wouldn't have, probably wouldn't have thought of. And so uh, that, that'll be next time. Who was Luke? Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. This has been an episode of Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday, so please be sure to subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcast listening app or on Bart Ehrman's YouTube channel so you don't miss out. From Bart Ehrman and myself, Megan Lewis, thank you for joining us.